Hi there, and welcome to the show. This is the College Problems Podcast, breaking down the more serious and lighthearted issues students everywhere are facing. And we're doing it mostly from a journalism, personal safety, and a young professor's perspective. I'm one of those professors. My name is Dan Reimold. Read my book, Journalism of Ideas, or check out my blog, College Media Matters. I'm joined today, as always, by the lovely and talented Christina Gaudio, personal safety educator, victims advocate, and victimology professor. We're going to start with early morning classes. The Daily Gamecock, the student newspaper at the University of South Carolina, in an editorial, wrote this about 8 a.m. classes specifically. Quote, very few people can truthfully say that they enjoy wrenching themselves out of bed at the crack of dawn for an 8 a.m. class. The earliest classes are the last ones filled and have the lowest attendance rates, and the least student participation. Not to mention they can be highly inconvenient for professors as well, since many with families are not able to drop their kids off at school if they have to be in the classroom so early. Chris, what's your take on the early morning class situation? Are you a fan at all? I think it depends. Are you asking me as a former student or as a professor? Do any students enjoy that experience? I feel like the 8 a.m. class is set up as the torture test of the college experience, more than almost anything else besides maybe finding parking. I, I have to agree with you there, yes. I remember I had an 8 a.m. math class, and I remember it was the worst form of torture that could ever have been made. But it's a great point that I do feel like certain classes might have the mojo or the lesson plans in place to be geared toward waking students up, or maybe even more importantly, being something that students want to wake up for. Yes. I don't think math is that. Definitely not. <laughs> I would agree there, especially when you, you're lucky your eyes are open and they're asking you to do algebra. Why do you think we, we hold classes at that time when it's obviously an unpopular uh, situation for students specifically? I, I think, you know, we're talking about college, so a lot of them are going to be getting jobs after college. And you have to face it, in some of your jobs, you know, you are at work, 8.30, 8 a.m. You know, some people go in really weird hours. Some people go in at 6.30. You know, my husband does that. He goes in at 6.30 in the morning and it's done by 4. It just depends on what type of job you're getting. So you kind of need to face that. Also, some of them are going to eventually have families with kids. Your kids are not going to be sleeping in. <laughs> so you better get used to it now. I feel like more than almost any culture, the college campus is a nighttime uh, heavy environment. You have extracurriculars, you have events, you have crazy amounts of studying, and obviously the other unofficial extracurricular activities involving partying and drinking and whatnot. And so in some ways, it simply doesn't vibe with the culture to then have to wake up at dawn to stumble into a classroom setting. And yet, students know what they're getting, or at least their parents should be warning them as they're shelling out you know, their checks or racking up student debt. You know, they're paying for the torture. They know there are going to be 8 a.m. classes, and maybe that is good for them, as you mentioned. Yeah, it can be. Now, as the professor side of it, you know, I was actually offered both sides. You know, do I want to teach morning classes, you know, three times a week or twice a week, or do I want a night class? I immediately opted for the night class. And, you know, that comes from different levels of life in the aspect that I have children, and it would be very difficult for me to get my kids lined up out the door and into some kind of care and commute to get to teach. So in those aspects, that's one of the reasons I did not choose morning. I choose evening classes, which gives a whole new level of issues, but it's night class. It's lose-lose, in my opinion, in that if you push back or eliminate the 8 a.m. class entirely, then the 9 a.m. or the 10 a.m. When do you stop? Becomes just as ripe for the student criticism, and we just want to sleep in a little bit more. And I've seen it as well. I, I often like to teach my journalism classes later in the afternoon, thinking that students will have more of a chance to interact with other students on campus if we do a quick reporting exercise or just a vibe to the notion that the creative juices are flowing and there's more of a journalistic vibe to, you know, 3 p.m. or 4 p.m. in the afternoon versus 8 or 9 in the morning. That's just the journalism way of things. But they complain just as much about the afternoon classes. They're tired. They've been in class all day. They want to go home. I was just going to say the 3 o'clock time frame is probably the worst time of day for me. I'm all like, wait, I need sugar. I need to wake up, you know, so I, I wouldn't be very good in your class. <laughs> and there's also, I, I love looking at this, uh, these sorts of things from an institutional perspective as well, because again, it's a classroom situation. It's a torture test for the students, and in certain cases, the professor. And it's also the fun challenge to see if you can overcome and make the students laugh and smile and actually have some energy by the time the 50 minutes or hour ends. Mm -hmm. But you better believe this also speaks to the crazy high enrollments that some uh, colleges and universities push for in which you now have to have a glut of classes in every available time space and day of the week simply to fit every student in and be able to give them what 
they are paying for. And so you better believe 8 a.m. classes are not going anywhere. Yeah, that's very true. So let's talk about uh, another topic that uh, is literally probably the, the opposite of what students would be thinking about in the morning, but is definitely a major activity and... All day long. <laughs> and definitely one with serious consequences, and that is sexting. Or in modern times, what also might be known by the verb Snapchatting or the like. What's going on here with students? You're taking sexually explicit messages or pictures and sending them to somebody, you know, via your cell phone, via email, all different types of digital communication. I always smile at things that automatically make me feel old. And I think the idea that we're talking about this as a separate issue is probably making some students giggle because they see it as just so ingrained in college life where, of course, this has just been something that's been going on forever. But I think the fascinating <laughs> thing that we can speak to is, yes. <laughs> I this has not been going on forever. I remember <laughs> vaguely having a, uh, a you know basic phone that could send some texts for a lot of money that you put on your plan. You were trying to be very careful about anything you would text out and you, you probably would not be doing the back and forth sexting communication to that degree. We were probably doing it in some other way yes. that I cannot remember at this point from my college I, I mean, experience. Maybe it was snail mail. I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> but this is definitely still, I would call, a new phenomenon and one that is really ramping up ever more in the visual age as it seems photos and even videos are replacing words in, in students' messages to each other. Yes. And often with pretty crazy consequences, correct? Yes. I mean, there's. I don't even think the majority of students realize that multiple states in the U.S. have actually made laws with, with sexting that if you're under 18 and you're sexting, it's child pornography, whether you're receiving it or sending it. So that's just something to keep in mind. You know, whether, and if you're over 18, there's a lot more other issues we need to discuss. You know, obviously, number one, you're, you are in, in your teens and you're taking sexually explicit pictures of yourself and sending them to a boyfriend or somebody you're dating. Now, you truly believe that this per, one person is looking at these pictures, but over half of the time, they're sharing it with more than one person other than themselves. From a, from a journalist, the, the social media tip is always to not tweet anything out you wouldn't be willing to put your byline on, with the idea being that you need to recognize that there's not a separation anymore to what you think you are doing privately mm -hmm. or informally and to what is being attached to your name and is getting out there to a wider audience than you realize. And it seems like that is something that would apply even to what you think is a private text communication. Most definitely, especially if you're talking about putting it over the email, if you're putting, talking about putting it through Facebook, even sometimes putting it through just even a text message or like we said, like a video chat message, that's going over the internet oh, most of the time. You're not deleting that. Just because you hit the delete button doesn't mean it goes away. Future employers, your kids are going to find these pictures. They don't vanish off of the internet. Well, and it's not that you're getting hacked like Jennifer Lawrence or Kate Upton, but, you know, you're dating someone who eventually may break up with you, who is not as scrupulous and honest as they seem, who is, you know, of a certain age in which peer pressure might, you know, force them to share something to be, you know, considered one of the cool kids when they're not looking out for your best interest. Or mm -hmm. things can simply be left around, or as you mentioned, not protected digitally, and people simply stumble upon them and find them. And, hey, it's the college mentality. We want to share and be cool and go viral and I've seen these things happen they often blow up as student newspaper stories I come across yep. in which private photos or things taken in a, a moment of drunken debauchery mm -hmm. end up spreading everywhere like wildfire yes it's very true it, I think the students have to realize if you are doing this and you're taking these photos and you're sending them out you need to understand the consequences that are going to come from them yes it seems fun yes it might seem silly and romantic at certain times there are other situations also where I've even heard students say they feel pressured to do this. Like it's become so common and so out there that what do you mean you haven't done that? You know, it's ridiculous the amount of people that are pressured to do something like this, then they do it and they regret it and they can't take it back. I feel like the, the most recent major celebrity hacking scandal in which so many nude photos mm -hmm. of uh, female celebrities in, in all walks of, of uh, entertainment and, and sports media has really put the conversation back on the front burner as just to how ingrained this is in our culture that even A-list celebrities are doing this without giving it a second thought or really seeing the potential warning signs, the writing on the wall. I think one angle that also needs to be addressed is that we often um, see this in the media narrative 
as a cautionary tale for the individuals who are taking and sharing these images, videos, or sexually explicit messages. And while I think that's absolutely important, I do think often we're missing the larger sense of, you know, there are perpetrators here who are also sharing these things mm-hmm. and hacking in and really doing this, uh, you know, these terrible things to people. They need to be exposed for what they are as well. You know, either literally hackers or in some ways, uh, you know, sexual assault perpetrators, depending on how you look at things. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I see where you're coming from with that, especially if, you know, you're sending it to a boyfriend and they're now all of a sudden, you know, sharing it with a whole bunch of other people that you consider something private. You know, now it's out there. This is a double-edged sword. This, this whole entire sexting phenomena. Because, you know, it's a situation where, you know, someone has to take responsibility for their actions, but their reactions of somebody else can't always be their responsibility. You know, if you or with someone, a long-term relationship, monogamous, and you share it with somebody, and that person does keep it to themselves, but somebody else stumbles upon it and finds it and makes a big deal out of it and spreads it around, you've got problems. So we can. there's so many different ways of doing it. At the end of the day, you might want to just sit down and say, is it really worth it? And the biggest lesson I feel is that whenever you see the A-list version of this scandal play out, It is always something that celebrities have done in their earlier days, in their younger days, before they were famous, that now is catching up with them, literally playing out like a, you know, stop and listen cautionary tale of be careful what you're doing, especially at the college age before you're really thinking about this sort of protection. Yes. And, 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 you know, it's really silly. It's something my mother always said when I was growing up, but just because everybody else is doing it doesn't mean you should. You know, if everybody jumped off the Brooklyn Bridge, are you going to jump too? So maybe you should be that person that's not comfortable with it and just stand your ground and say, you know, when I'm 40 years old and someone's looking to promote me with a really big company and they stumble upon these pictures, I don't want them to be a me. Oh, God. If, if all of our lives are, are haunted by 20-year-old Snapchat screenshots that someone took, I think it's going to be a, a tough society. But that that is the reality of any cases that we're living in. All right. Thanks for tuning in, guys. Join us next time for the College Problems Podcast.